So um, this ad is sponsored by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Hi there, this is Robin Norgren and I'm your host for Montessori Creativity and the Meaning of Life. You can find all the work that I do on my links on Instagram under Robin underscore Norgren or at UBU for Life. I'd like to start with some words from Walking on Water by Madeline Lango. One summer at a writer's conference, I felt that something was wrong with most of the juvenile manuscripts I received. Not all of them, but enough so that it worried me, especially because I couldn't put my finger on what was wrong. On the last day of the conference, all the workshops were open and almost everybody attended them all. Most of the students had been in two or three workshops, so I had the opportunity to listen to poems, stories, sections of novels, written by the men and women from my workshop. In almost every case, the work in the other workshops was better than the work they had turned into me. I had discovered, to my horror, that I had been, they had been writing down, not so much down to children, as down to themselves, writing below their own capacity. I listened to an excellent story written by a young man who had turned in some indifferent material to me, And after class, I figuratively shook him as I said, that is the way you write for children. The way you wrote that story, not the junk you wrote for me. A child is not afraid of new ideas, does not have to worry about the status quo or rocking the boat, is willing to sail into uncharted waters. Those tired old editors who had a hard time understanding a wrinkle in time assumed that children couldn't understand it either. Even when Frar, Strauss, and Garreau, to which house I am devoted, decided to take a risk in taking it, they warned me they did not expect it to sell well, and they did not think it could possibly be read by anyone under high school age. This is the typical underestimation of the adult as to the capacity of children who understand philosophical, scientific, scientific, and theological concepts. But there is no idea that is too difficult for children, as long as it underlies a good story and quality writing. As to A Wrinkle in Time, it reflects my discovery that higher math is easier than lower math, that higher math deals with ideas ask questions which may not have single answers. My reading of Einstein, Eddington, James, Heisenberg was to me an adventure in theology. I had been reading too many theologians, particularly German theologians. I was at a point in my life where my faith in God and the loving purposes of creation were very insecure, and I wanted desperately to have my faith strengthened. If I could not believe in a God who truly cared about every atom and sub subatom of his creation, then life seemed hardly worth living. I asked questions, cosmic questions, and the German theologians answered them all. And they were questions which should not have been answered in such a finite, laboratory-proof manner. I read their rigid answers, and I thought sadly, and if I have to believe all this limiting of God, then I cannot be a Christian, and I wanted to be one. I had yet to learn the faithfulness of doubt. This is often assumed by the judgmental to be faithlessness, but it is not. It is a prerequisite of a living faith. Francis Bacon wrote, 
If we believe with certainties, we will end in doubt. If we begin with doubts and hear them and bear them patiently, we may end in certainty. The Anonymous Arthur of the Cloud of Unknowing writes, By love, God may be gotten and holden, but by thought or understanding, never. Love, not answers. Love, which trusts God so implicitly, despite the cloud. And is it not the cloud a sign of God? That it is brave enough to ask questions, no matter how fearful. It was the scientists with their questions, their awed rapture at the glory of the created universe, who helped to convert me. In a sense, A Wrinkle in Time was the rebuttal to the German theologians. It was also my affirmation of a universe in which I could take note of all the evil and unfairness and horror, and yet believe in a loving creator. I thought of it at that time, is probably a very heretical book, theologically speaking, which is a delightful little joke at my expense, because it is, I have been told, theologically a completely orthodox book. The Holy Spirit has a definite sense of humor. Daniel Laporte says in her book, The White Hot Truth, On my own healing journey, I called on psychologists, Buddhists, the super woos, and the medical professionals, both traditional and alternative. There's a lot of overlap amongst them, of course, but here's what I learned. Each form of assistance is on its own terrifically helpful and utterly incomplete. If you want to take your life to the next level, You need backup from multiple perspectives and traditions. You're complex, and your support system needs to be as multifaceted, robust, and weird as you are. When I was going through something, and when are we not going through something, I'd circle back to my beloved therapist for some of his wisdom and understanding. In addition to our cherished interaction, I was always exchanging the names of energy workers on the side with my friends. It was like trading mystical baseball baseball cards. Ooh, I got this guy who'll clean your chakras and do some soul imprinting stuff. What's soul imprinting? Dunno, but we did this journey thing and I cleared so much shit. Why don't you tap that shit out, EFT, Emotional Freedom Technique. I tap before all my meetings now, really helps with my anxiety. I'm teaching my kids to tap. I need some more. I need more than tapping. I want like an exorcism of all the bullshit. I know. I know. What about that healer who used to be a psychiatrist who does the divine light sessions? She has dream visions for you the night before, and then you work with your guides to clear your stuff out. Now we're talking. Can you text me your number? I felt like I was cheating on my psychotherapist with my energy worker. And I was concerned that my energy worker was going to be hurt if I wanted to talk things through with my therapist. And would my naturopath be mad if I surrendered to my MD and took some antibiotics? And forget about my gyno. She diagnosed me as a total flake when I told her that, gasp, acupuncture was all that I needed. Well, I've heard acupuncture can be moderately useful, she said, with her arms folded. There wasn't one type of practitioner or counselor who could help me navigate my entire course of self-care. And the more mystical my learning experiences became, the more I felt like I was going to have to go it alone. My girlfriend referred me to a trauma release massage therapist after I was in a car accident. Tell me what happened, she asked in her thick Swiss accent. The other guy ran a red light and T-boned me. My car was totaled. I got out and stood in the rain waiting for the cops to come. My hips and shoulder are bruised from the seatbelt, but I'm fine. I just kind of walk away. Pause.
pause. Is that all? she asked, slightly suspecting I was withholding something. I clammed up. Yep, that's it. I nodded, quickly biting my lip. Could not even begin to explain to her that milliseconds before impact, I heard a verse, a voice that told me, everything is going to be okay. And okay meant I wasn't going to be hurt in this accident. And that I'd be well and held in this entire lifetime. And that my son, who fortunately was not in the car with me, would also be okay for this entire lifetime. And I found myself floating in the most peculiar way, in deep ink blue space amongst luminous clear white stars. It was the same space I visited during those some meditations. And it wasn't I wasn't a star. And I was in space. I was me with God. And me was we, was I. And everything was so blissfully, peacefully perfect. There isn't a word or a library of words to describe the sheer perfection of it all. It was so quiet that I could hear magnificence. That all happened in linear seconds. But I felt like I was in space for hours. I could have stayed for weeks. Who was going to help me process that ride? Maybe science in this case? A place I usually turn to last for answers. Astronauts who've been to space often have a spontaneous spiritual experience called the overview effect. They talk about the vastness, that sudden macro understanding of the planet, and how perfect, fragile, and breathtaking it is. With that God's eye view, they understand how we all belong to each other. And they report that it's a simultaneously peaceful and lonely experience. I let the massage therapist work on my hip flexors. Then I went to my shrink to analyze my feelings about what happened after the accident. The breathtakingly beautiful exchange I had with the timid man who caused the crash followed by an excruciating conflict that same night with my then-husband. And then, of course, I did a session with my energy worker to see if my trauma from all of the related events were lurking in my cells. But I kept the real story to myself. I wanted to let it live in the center of my center, where my inner space had met all of space. To be in touch by analysis to be utterly and completely known. And I wondered if maybe I'd write about it someday, quietly, which you know can be the best therapy of all. I did an interview with an artist named Sarah Schilling and I documented it in my book called Your Creative Peace. Find and deepen your creative voice while communing with God. Here's an excerpt from that interview. Sadie Schilling Studio. Her website is a picturebooklife.com. She says, I grew up antiquing and crafting with my family. My grandma is a quilter, seamstress, and cross-stitcher, painter, and all-around crafter. My mom was amazing at cross-stitch as well, and also a beautiful writer. My sister inherited the design gene. She knows, just like my mom and grandma, how to make even an ordinary day in space so special. I think that everything I do and everything I make comes out of the way my creative spirit is loved and nourished by these three amazing women. I grew up in Oklahoma's green country in the midst of the humidity in the Midwest. Sunny Colorado is the adopted home of my heart, 
and I'm making a new life with my family in a town near Hamburg, Germany. I studied art, literature, and education in college and earned a bachelor's and master's degree in English and teaching arts. I have worked as a copywriter and as a teacher, but now I'm a mom to my two little girls and I paint and write about art. What is one of your earliest creative memories? As a kid, I would make these tiny little books, about two inches square, that I would use to write and illustrate a story and then carry around in my pockets to pull out to read when I got bored. There was a series, actual, actually, The Adventures of Super Cat. How did you find your creative voice? I was always good at drawing. My mom enrolled me in after-school classes when I was in elementary school and I took every art class I could in high school. I even started college as an art major, but I think the problem was I didn't have my own creative voice. I loved art and I loved to create, but I mostly did it because it was fun and I was good at it. It wasn't until I faced some heartache and uncertainty as an adult that art became a refuge for me. Then a year ago, my family moved to Germany and as God put me in a place where I have sometimes felt more alone than ever before, I have become more dependent on Him in my moment-to-moment -moment life, including my artistic inspiration, and I feel like I've finally found my creative voice, because art has been therapy for me in so many ways. I want to tap into that comfort that I received and create work that serves as a comfort and encouragement for others. Did you have a creative habit that made a smooth transition into your adult life? As an art major at university, it became a chore to make art, even when I was uninspired and when I was covered with papers to write for my other studies, so I quit. I had planned to attend a proper art school after I finished my practical teaching degree. Six years later, I had two practical degrees and a prestigious teaching job and I was very unhappy. I felt stunted and trapped. Plus, my mom had just passed away and between grad school, my new job, and taking over some of the clients of my mom's PR firm, I simply left myself no room to process the grief. Fi following a sudden prompting in our hearts, in 2006, my husband and I dropped everything and moved to the beautiful, suddenly place of Colorado. It was an escape of sorts, but now I know that more than that, it was a rescue. The only painting I had done in years was on the walls in the house my husband and I had purchased and renovated together, only to sell it when we moved to Colorado less than two years later. I had also made a couple of simple little canvases as gifts for friends. My work then wasn't amazing. I was rusty after so much time away from painting, and my imagination was inhibited by stress. But somehow, art began to represent freedom for me and a new life. So once we got to Colorado, I painted for hours every day in the basement of our friend's house where we lived for a time before we found work. And this is when I began to call myself an artist. I have not gone long without a paintbrush in my hand for the last five years. How has God been a part of your creative process? When my mom passed away, I dealt with the grief, or didn't deal with it, by making myself busy, 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 with no room to think about it. When I had a miscarriage three years later, God used painting to slow me down, face the heartache, and reverse the damage all that stress had caused in my health and in my emotions. Because my art, return to art, coincided with this intense time of healing, painting is still almost always spiritual for me. Painting is how I work out the things in my heart and remains a way for me to slow down and listen for his voice.